I'm going to make some uh, comments mostly about a little more economics and politics and less on human rights. As Marion pointed out, I serve on the, what, the other China Commission, not the one that Mr. Pittenger's on, but the one that uh, focuses on the security relationship between the United States and China, uh, defined as in both economic and, and uh, military terms. Uh, I'm not here on their behalf. I'm here as president of the National Foreign Trade Council, but it has permitted me to uh, travel uh, almost annually to China and to uh, spend a lot of time studying them. And uh, our annual report will be out. Uh, the, the other commission, uh, Congressman Pinder's com commission, beat us to it this year. Their report is already out. Uh, ours is coming out on November 18th. And I would urge you to uh, take a look at that. Uh, I would also urge you, apropos of today's topic, to take a look at a, a study that appears on the commission's website that was done for us, not by us, uh, by the Economic Strategy Institute entitled <clears throat> The Evolving Role of China in International Institutions. This came out in 2011, but I think it still has a lot to say about the way China behaves inside international institutions, which is one of the things that, that <clears throat> we're talking about today. And they literally went um, institution by institution and talked about uh, China's uh, role in, in some detail. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, it's probably the definitive piece on the subject. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, their arrival on the world trade stage, if you will, will, began with their WTO accession, and I think it's a fair statement, as Marion said, that the logic here was that right. their participation in the WTO and their integration, hopefully, into the global trading system would lead, ultimately, to legal and political reforms as well in the PRC. Um, there's considerable debate about whether that was a, a correct uh, attitude at the time. Um, I'm of the view that uh, it was then, and, and it is now, as long as you don't talk about when, because I don't think that's going to happen, uh, certainly in my lifetime, although looking out at, at a, what appears to be a younger crowd, it's probably going to happen in, in some of your lifetimes. But <clears throat> I think it is and remains a viable theory, but it's one that is not going to happen simply by itself, and there are strategies that the United States and others can pursue to, to um, encourage the Chinese to move in that direction. But let me provide a little context, um, which I hope will also uh, bear on what my colleagues are gonna say shortly. Uh, we're dealing with a country that has been engaged in probably the fastest and largest economic rise in history uh, they've lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, one can argue there's a price that's paid for that. Uh, I think Mr. Pittenger alluded to that. Uh, but I, at the same time, you can't take that away from them. It's a significant, uh, if not historical, uh, uh, accomplishment. They didn't do it via uh, communism in the theoretical sense. They did it via uh, what Chalmers Johnson called state developmental capitalism which is a term for heavy state intervention in or guidance of the economy. That was a successful uh, uh, model with some variations uh, for Japan and for Korea, uh, actually now for Taiwan to a degree, and now for China. There's a serious debate going on um, in economic circles over whether that's run out of gas, uh, whether they are going to either be able to undertake the reforms, the economic reforms they need to undertake to sustain growth, or whether they'll endure a hard or soft uh, landing, implosion, or whether they can keep doing what they're doing indefinitely without consequences uh, and without reform. And there is a school of thought that says that. Their dilemma, I think, is that the reforms that they need to undertake in order to revitalize their economy and allow it to continue to grow at a relatively fast pace inevitably is going to mean some loss of party control. And the dilemma the party leadership faces is that they don't want to do that. And they are constantly trying to balance the need to take some steps to reform with the fact that there are going to be political consequences to that, whether they want to or not. Uh, those consequences, I think, are not democracy in the sense that we know it, but it certainly would lead to a, a China in which the role of the party is different than the way it is, what it is right now. Uh, that said, the success of their economic policy, which until last year meant uh, you know, more than 10% annual growth for more than 20 years, uh, has been a perception on their part that they're a rising power, which has gone along with the perception on their part that the United States is a declining power. 
Uh, we can argue about that. Um, but I think one thing that's hard to argue about is that that perception of ships passing in the night, if you will, one on the way up, one on the way down, creates a serious potential for miscalculation. Uh, and I think we face gro growing risks, uh, particularly in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, which I'll get to in a minute, going forward. And it, it, it's a message to the United States and others that we need to proceed uh, with this relationship very carefully. Now, that view that they're a rising power, along with the inevitable insecurity of uh, party leadership, leadership about their job uh, and their legitimacy in the country, has led, have led uh, Xi Jinping uh, to move China's policy in some more aggressive directions, some of which you've already heard about today. I would mention three, although they're not the only ones. One is a domestic crackdown on dissidents and journalists and really anybody <laughs> that could be seen as a potential alternative power center. Um, second, the anti-corruption anti drive, which is badly needed, but really undertaken to enhance uh, uh, the party's control and the party's legitimacy in the eyes of the public. And three, a more uh, assertive uh, international policy, particularly in, in the ocean surrounding them, that uh, have the uh, dual effects of promoting nationalism at home and bringing back on the part of others distant memories of actually Chinese imperial policies going back a long way. Um, my thesis in graduate school was that the uh, Maoism is, uh, is really Confucianism in disguise, and uh, we could debate that, but I think the long, more time that passes, uh, the more I think that I was right, and that was a really long time ago. Um, these efforts, these policies they're pursuing, I think, are essentially efforts on Xi's part to solidify party control and in the process restore China to its historical role of predominance in, in Asia. In doing that, I think uh, they have a clear, very clear sense of what their interests are. As somebody who negotiated with them when I was in the government, I would say they probably have a clearer idea of what's in their interest than anybody else that I've had to work with and they work uh, single-mindedly to advance their goals. They don't do gifts, they don't do favors, uh, they don't do things to sustain the system, uh, they do things to advance their interests. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're, not a, that they're against win-win situations, that doesn't mean they're against things that do sustain the system and promote global growth, or even things that are good for us, but they have to be things that are good for them at the same time. Uh, and that's one thing that distinguishes them from us, uh, actually, or, or uh, even the British in the first half of the, uh, of the last century, uh, who were global hegemons who did things for the, the stability and goodness of the system, uh, which most of the time were in their own interests, but not always. Uh, in that context, internationally, they've shown themselves willing to do two things, uh, among others, they use existing institutions to their advantage, uh, insisting in the process on a level of influence commensurate with their own perceived importance. Uh, they've joined a lot of institutions in the last 20 years. Uh, the WTO is a good example, and they've been adroit uh, in maneuvering within that institution to the point now where they've, in essence, sort of captured one of the deputy director general seats for themselves. For themselves. It used to belong to the Indians. Um, and now belongs to the Chinese. Uh, one of them belongs to the Americans, and one of them belongs to the Europeans, and you know, the others come and go. But, uh, and they've learned, I think, uh, very effectively within the institution as to how to play the game. Uh, they also have not uh, hesitated to create new institutions that they either can control or influence uh, more directly. The AIIB, uh, the RCEP and the SCO all come to mind as, uh, come to mind as examples of that. Uh, let me say, though, that both of these uh, things can be uh, constructive roles. They've demonstrated, uh, in my mind anyway, themselves capable of working within existing multilateral institutions to, cooper to cooperative ends, uh, not always, uh, and certainly only when it's in their interest. But if you look at their behavior in the WTO, in APEC, and on and off in the UNFCC, which is the climate change organization, uh, you can see, frankly, a mixed record. You can see things where they've been uh, obstructionist and you can, and, uh, in the UNFCC context, particularly in Copenhagen, but you've also seen uh, other situations where they've worked together, particularly with us, uh, on climate change issues in, in, to produce potentially win-win outcomes. We'll see what happens at the next 
uh, COP meeting uh, in Paris of the UN talks, and we'll see how they behave there. Uh, there have been occasions in the WTO where they worked with the Americans and the Europeans uh, to produce uh, agreed upon outcomes. They were helpful in the uh, trade facilitation agreement when the Indians were conspicuously were not helpful. Um, they have been helpful up to a point on the expansion of the information technology agreement uh, where the Indians didn't even, it didn't even participate. So, you know, it's a mixed record, but what they have demonstrated over the years is that when they see an outcome that's good for them, uh, they are prepared to work with others to achieve that outcome. And if it's a good outcome for others, that's okay. But uh, the fundamental uh, principle, nevertheless, is it has to be primarily a good outcome for the Chinese. Now, I would argue, in, in conclusion, that the appropriate U.S. response to this kind of tactic is engagement at all levels in all of these fora, not just the ones where we have more influence, but also the new ones. I would argue that opposing AIIB, AIIB was a mistake on our part. Uh, we would be better off always inside the tent uh, than outside the tent. And we need both inside the tent and in both in the new organizations and in the old ones, we need to go about our business of creating a modern rule of law based international trading system. That's what we do and I think the world is better off for it in the long run. And the issue is how do we bring the Chinese into that system even though it's not of primary interest to them. And in an odd way, that's what TPP is about. TPP in, in, the, in the world of, of pool is, is a bank shot. Because what's going on, what, what's going on, what went on in TPP is here is this giant elephant in the room, China, but they're not at the table. Uh, and it's convenient that they're not at the table because, because they're not at the table, what that means, what that meant was we could negotiate a good set of rules about behavior, about how state-owned enterprises are supposed to operate, how intellectual property is supposed to be protected, rules on labor, rules on the environment, a whole bunch of rules on on sanitary and phytosanitary standards, all of which would apply to China were they to join the TPP, uh, and none of which they participated in negotiating. Had they been at the table, we would not have come out with as good a set of rules as we did. Uh, now, some might say, well, so what? You know, they're never going to join, so who cares? I think that's probably wrong um, over time. Their initial reaction, of course, was this was all part of the American plot to encircle them. But what you've seen in the last couple of years is a change of tone uh, in China to the point now where they say they're studying it very closely, and they are studying it very closely. And the reason that they're studying it is because they have, as I said, a more acute sense of what's in their interest than anybody I've worked with, and they can see how this is going to end up being in their interest, or to look at it another way, how not being in it is not going to be in their interest. Because from their point of view, what's going to happen with TPP, assuming it's implemented, which we'll see. The text came out this morning at 3 a.m., so most of my colleagues are back reading the 1,171 pages of it or whatever it is, um, which is what I need to do later, but we'll see. But assuming it's implemented, assuming the 12 countries implement it, assuming it grows, because you've had Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia all say they want to join, We'll see, but that's what they say. Assuming it grows, what China is going to fairly quickly see is a region, and actually world, in which global value chains, global supply chains, are created around them rather than in them. And uh, Chinese entrepreneurs are not dummies, and what you're going to see them doing is moving to Vietnam uh, to take advantage of rules of origin which provide favorable treatment to stuff that is built inside the zone as opposed to stuff that is built outside the zone. And it's going to be very, very clear, assuming that you know, it grows, TPP grows, to the Chinese that from economic reasons, they're better off in than out. Will they join? Uh, the, maybe. The point is that if they join, there's all these rules, rule of law based, uh, Western trading system rules, that they're going to have to step up and adhere to, because that's the only way you get in. That's the idea uh, behind it, and it's, as I said, it's a bank shot. It's not direct engagement with China on things that they don't want to do and things that they regard as an infringement on their sovereignty, but it's the creation of 
institutions, multilateral institutions, with other people who do want to participate in that kind of system to create a successful model, we hope, which they will ultimately uh, end up engaging in. That's why I'm a short-term pessimist, because this is not going to happen very quickly, and we're going to continue to have a difficult relationship with them, um, particularly over military issues that I alluded to. But I'm a long-term optimist, because I think 10 years from now, uh, they'll be in, and they'll be looking at these rules in a different way, and that we will have much more of uh, a law-based system in China than we certainly have now. And with that, I yield to my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Probably Ryan. don't agree with me, but go ahead. So now we'll turn to Dr. Wilson. Okay. Thank you. Nice to be here. I've been living abroad for seven years. It's great to be back in America. This is my first time in Washington, D.C. I lived in Beijing from 2009 to 2012. Um, a rough period at times. In my second year, I saw my American doctor, and he scolded me. He said, shame on you, Wilson, uh, for smoking. And uh, he said I was smoking approximately 40 cigarettes a day, and I, and I have never smoked a cigarette in my life. Uh, in year three, I tested uh, positive for embalming fluid. So... <laughs> It was it was time to get out of Be it was time to get out of Beijing, so I was Ernst and Young's global chief economist. So I went to Moscow to open the Moscow office, and it started off well. Then I made the mistake of criticizing the Kremlin, and um, received uh, death threats. I came home in the middle of the day. I lived in a, a Stalin era flat west of the Kremlin. And there were three men in my apartment, and they were not my friends. <laughs> so I, I said, it, it's time to go home. It's time to go home. So this is my first time in Washington, D.C. And um, I remember the first week I was here, I was sitting with my new colleagues, and they looked at me and they said, have you worked on the Hill before? And I said, what hill? <laughs> what hill? <laughs> so there are people outside the Beltway and people inside the Beltway. And I don't think people outside the Beltway like people inside the Beltway. I mean, we've seen that over the last uh, four months. But my, 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 overall, my Beijing experience was a very positive experience. I'm a financial economist. I worked in the banking industry for eight years in uh, the Middle East and in the U.S. So a lot of that will, will be uh, uh, focused on that. And I have to say this, um, I, I kid with my boss at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, my speech is because I focus on emerging markets uh, like Brazil and Russia and China. Um, my speeches recently tend to be uh, bleak and dark. And so he says he will only speak with me late in the day so he can go out and get a drink <laughs> immediately. <laughs> My previous boss was smarter and just kept a bottle of scotch in, in his office. But in essence, the Chinese economy has a cancer and it has metastasized. Essentially, the, uh, the three pillars of growth, and as my learned colleague has said, phenomenal, you know, phenomenal growth the past 30, 35 years, approximately 9 to 10%. Uh, those three pillars of growth have fractured, significantly fractured. That's a domestic gross investment. I hope not to get too technical now. I'm not only a, an, an economist, but a mathematician. So I'll, I'll try to keep the, uh, the math to a, a minimum. But domestic gross investment, uh, of, course, of course exports, and of course the, the, the property markets. We've seen exports go from two global, the, the global share of Chinese exports go from 
2.5 percent in 2000 to about 12.5 percent today. That's an enormous growth. The global economy won't allow that to increase very much for a variety of reasons. I won't go into in too much detail. One reason, of course, is that the global economy is growing at one half its rate. It was about a, a decade ago. And what is not well known, uh, exports have not been a source of growth for the Chinese economy since 2008. What I focus on more than anything else as a, as a banker is debt and leverage. I look at every detail. There's been an enormous uh, buildup in leverage and debt in China, and, and actually, it's an untold story. No one's writing about it. Actually, in all of Asia, it's one of my reasons why I believe economic growth in Asia um, has peaked. And the, uh, the soaring debt and growing in income inequalities have put enormous pressure on the authorities to abandon its current economic model. If you look at the, I'll give you a couple stats and then lay off it. If you look at the, um, the economies that have, the, uh, that have had a, a sharp rise in private debt, China leads the pack with the rise of 70 percentage points, not level, a rise of 70 percentage points in the ratio of corporate and household debt to GDP between 2007, 2014. If you add financial sector debt, the rise in gross private indebtedness is, again, rise, not stock, rise, 110 percentage points. With government growth included, it's about 124 percentage points. And if you told me this, my next stat, if you told me this five years ago, I would have told you uh, you were crazy. At 125 percent of GDP, China has one of the highest levels of corporate debt in the world. Uh, the stock of corporate debt now exceeds that of the United States. Can you believe that? Corporate debt as a share of GDP in China is larger than it is in the United States. And then these figures are not reliable. We admit it, these are estimates. Local government debt amounts to about at least 30% of GDP in the last count. It could be, it could be much higher. Uh, last, my last statistic on debt, according to McKinsey, uh, China's debt has quadrupled from $7 trillion U.S. dollars um, in 2007 uh, to about $28 trillion as of uh, mid-2014, reaching a little under 300% of uh, gross domestic product. And much of this credit is now being used, used, being used to roll over existing credit and not creating new business enterprises. That's an important point. Um, then, the, then we have the housing market which has been a critical source of growth. The housing market is, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the stock market. I, I, li I lived in China for over three years. I've I never owned a Chinese stock. I'll go into details later why I've never owned a Chinese stock. But um, the housing market is much more important in China than the, um, uh, this, the, the, the equity market. Uh, I, lived in, I lived in a building with 24 floors. I lived in the 22nd floor. I never waited more than um, 20 seconds for the elevator because there were only eight people living in the building. It was like the Stanley, I used to take my cat down to the lobby. It was like, Stan, what was the Stanley Kubrick movie about the hotel? Oh, The Shining, yeah. I'd go downstairs, and it, 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 was, it was spooky. It was, it, was so, it was so empty. But one great thing about being on the ground, I, I got, got to talk to developers. And uh, the consensus was 
there's a backlog of 70 million homes. 70 million homes. And you may say, well, that, if, well if that's the case, <laughs> housing prices have to be falling. Well, the, actually they are. They've been falling for two years in the tier one, tier two, and tier three cities for about, for about 18 to 24 months. Now you may say, well, with its massive uh, foreign exchange reserves, China has the capacity to handle a financial crisis. Three point, it's, it's down to about $3.6 trillion foreign exchange reserves. I don't, I, don't, I don't question that number, it seems reliable. Um, that's not the question. The question is whether China could man manage this without a significant slowdown in growth. I say no. First of all, much of China's growth has been fueled by an excess reliant on credit, an enormous reliant on credit, especially since 2008 when it had its, uh, the mother of all stimulus packages. So you've had a, uh, so a protracted period of deleveraging would put credit growth below nominal GDP growth. Um, I mean, think, think about the United States. Look at the U.S. The United States has grown less than 3% for nine consecutive years. I went back, go on the website, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, BEA.gov, and go back, way back, even to the Great Depression. Obviously, the Great Depression was worse because you had greater volatility. You won't find a period where the United States grew at less than 3% uh, for nine consecutive years. For, you know, for a variety of reasons, but one big reason was a, um, a, a, a protracted period of deleveraging, household deleveraging, and even government deleveraging. Um, an enormous de uh, deceleration in credit is needed because many important industries are already producing at less than 75% of capacity. Um, and this, this important figure, it's my prima facie uh, evidence. Deflation at the producer price level, you've had pr uh, deflation at the producer price level for 44 uh, consecutive months. That's, it's mind boggling. And then, a, n a number I, I've never gotten over before, um, gross investment, gross asset investment has been, 50, been running about 50% of GDP. Even during the glory days of Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, South Korea, gross investment as a share of GDP never ran more than 35%. This is not a sustainable equilibrium it has to come down, and then the sooner it comes down, the better. Otherwise, you, you exacerbate uh, the excess capacity in a lot of these basic industries. Chinese banks have failed to recognize in their books how misallocated investment has overstated GDP. Officially, non-performing loans are almost non-existent in the banking system. There's been no significant bankruptcies because Chinese banks have not correctly written down the bad debt, past GDP growth has been overstated by an amount equal to all the bad loans that have not been written down, a fairly large number that may amount to as much as 20 to 30 percent of GDP. This transfer must reduce future growth uh, in China. Moreover, China's private sector is already high, highly indebted. Any collapse in investment demand and activity is also likely to have a significant negative impact on profits. This would damage corporate solvency and lower investment even further. Debt levels have grown faster than debt did 
in Japan, South Korea, and the U.S. before uh, these economies tumbled in the recession. Um, my colleagues at the Heritage Foundation think I'm a bright guy. Um, they're mistaken. Uh, when I was painting my, my house as a young man for the first time, I actually painted myself into a corner. <laughs> Couldn't get out. Had to wait for it to dry or just walk, walk over the paint. I think the Chinese authorities have essentially painted themselves into a corner, and in short, China has few good options. Any real reform that triggered wealth, the so-called rebalancing, you've heard so much about the last three years, that has transferred wealth from the state to the household sector would probably trigger a, a severe financial crisis and recession in the short run. B, no reform, on the other hand, delays the, the inevitable. In other words, another stimulus package, making the economy even more unbalanced, more debt, and making the eventual pain even more severe. Either way, you're looking at a hard landing. The question is whether you do it now or whether you do it later. The best outcome is that it happens as quickly as possible. I'm not saying China's going away. China's not going away. China's going to remain the major economic and military power in Asia for decades. But it has to go through a crisis first. It must go through a crisis first. I, when I quit academia, I lived in Detroit, <laughs> of all places. Boy, I can pick them, <laughs> places to live. And I lived under my, uh, my mentor, the, the great David Littman. And uh, when things looked really bad for cities or states or countries, he'd always come back and say, cheer up, Bill. Things are getting worse. What he meant by that it was our fundamental philosophy that cities, states, and nation states don't make fundamental economic reforms in most cases unless there's a crisis. So a crisis over the long haul will be actually prob probably a, a good thing for China. Um, Talked on long enough. Let me finish this one thing. I have a colleague, a very learned colleague, who uses this analogy. It's not my analogy, but um, I'll finish with this. Um, we think of after the revolution in 49, China as a tricycle. A, tri a tricycle has three wheels, and we've all ridden tricycles as kids and they tend to be very balanced. And the three wheels of uh, initially back, way back in 49, were equality, some semblance of equality, economic growth, of course, the state has to deliver the economic goods, and nationalism was the third wheel. Well, there, uh, in terms of the first wheel, there's no misconception, not, not uh, uh, there's no uh, income equality in China. Not even, the, not even the authorities make any pretense that there's <laughs> any sense of income inequality. It's some of the worst in the world. So you, you go from a tricycle, you lose one wheel, to a bicycle, slightly less stable. China, as recently as four years ago, was growing at 10%. We believe that right now it's growing a roughly, we can't be sure, but roughly 5%, not the stated six and a half, seven percent 7%, and that it's decelerating, it's falling. So what if China loses the second wheel? It becomes what? A unicycle, one wheel. Unicycles are not very stable. That unicycle, of course, is nationalism. 
We're seeing it in, in the east, in um, uh, South China Sea, which makes it very dangerous. So at the Heritage Foundation, we'll be quite honest, I'm, we're not exactly happy with China growing at 10% a year. By the rule of 72, if you're growing at 10% a year, your economy doubles in size every seven years, as their military budget has. But we do not want to see China crash and burn. We want to see a transition to a more market-based, uh, a market-based system, and obviously a more de democratic-based system. Because if the party's legitimacy is based upon um, just nationality, it makes for, as we say in economics, a very unstable equilibrium. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to stand? Yeah. Uh, since Xi Jinping, uh, assuming that his uh, absolute power uh, three years ago, people believed that uh, he will uh, lead China towards a very powerful and probably number one economy in the world after several years competition with US. And also people have the great expectation on him that the modernization of China and also their so-called modernization and civilization removing uh, the kind of uh, export to the whole world uh, with the Confucius academies established in major American universities and European universities and so on and so forth. And what has Xi Jinping done actually so far? We could see that he has uh, gained in some way with uh, the campaign of anti-corruption. Uh, majority of the people in China support him, said it's good deed. Yes, I agree in some way. And also I think there the campaign is actually this, uh, selective, and it's uh, just short term. And it's more emphasized on the competition of the power within the party, within the government. So in that way, you could see that Xi Jinping, he actually control all powers that he can think of. He has been the leadership uh, that has been the group leaders of the, all the powerful institutions in China, including uh, reform, including finance, and some previous job has been done by the premier. He took all those power. Some people say, oh, that's a good thing for him, because when he monopolized all power, that means he has, he has no uh, barriers, no uh, barriers to do anything he likes to do. So people sometimes have the expectation on him on the political reform. <laughs> so I would say in China nowadays actually has no form at all, whether it's a political or economic. Um, just see it for this three years, we could see that the economic GDP growth has been slowing down. And this year Xi Jinping said we should maintain 6.5 instead of the seven. So that's more uh, regression. And people also say that, I mean, the, the authority says that uh, it's the new normal. It's the new normal that means we have to accustom to those, the low speed of GDP growth, not 10% or 8% anymore. Maybe seven or 65, or maybe next year six. So as some people estimated, it could be five, actually, because few people really believe in China's uh, statistics in several decades. But I give you a different answer. I would say if you use a wrong scale, then the logic is the same. 
the skill might not be accurate, but you use the same skill for several decades, then the logic will be the same. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll show some data here. Um, there are some states, uh, statistics that started with uh, 2013, which uh, is, uh, for this year, we can only get partial data for this year, 2005, uh, 15, and you can see the main trade partners of China, uh, for some of them, uh, the surplus, the trade surplus of China has been decreased, but some deficit has been increased. If you see some next uh, few charters. Uh, for this first half year, China's import and export total uh, is quite big, but down 6.9% year on year. In, a, in the meantime, the foreign reserves has been uh, decreased from uh, decreased about 90 billion RMB, uh, 90 billion US dollars uh, within 14 months. And also there's a serious capital uh, flow, outflow. It is about 900, 900 billion US dollars has been flowed overseas. The major, uh, major gold country is uh, US. So some, in some cities in US, like uh, uh, Bay Areas, uh, California, and Los Angeles, New York, and also this uh, great uh, Washington DC, uh, including the, the states of the Virginia and the Maryland. You will see a lot of the foreign, uh, in a lot of the Chinese investments, uh, some of them are just a direct purchase of the real estates and land. So in this half year, you could see uh, the total import and export value, and also there's some decrease in ratio. And for, if you see for the, the half six months, you'll see uh, minus 6.9%. So that's very big, big drop. And if we see uh, more uh, data here, you could see uh, the balance has been dropped too. For some countries, even it's, uh, we have the deficits, like uh, Australia and some other countries we have the, uh, in recent years has been deficits in trade. So there's a lot of more to compare with. If we uh, compare, uh, started with 1983 to the present, then we could see the trade surplus increased uh, in the certain year has been huge. Like this year, uh, 60.34 billion US dollars. Uh, if we compare with uh, some of the previous data, if we compare with the data from 1983, of course, there's uh, several uh, judgments who will say we have uh, made huge progress. And that's why nowadays Western countries show different attitudes to China, especially with Xi Jinping's visit. Like uh, last month uh, in September, uh, he visited USA. He uh, made the assignment with the uh, total value of, uh, uh, I think, the 30 billion US dollars. And with his uh, visit to Britain, it's about 40 billion uh, English pounds. So it seems that uh, the Western powers also show some kind of compromise and shoes after some uh, 
what I say, the favorable attitudes toward those uh, dictatorship. So for the human rights issues, uh, many institutions in US and in uh, Europe, they try to avoid to mentioning. Uh, and also uh, for some academic institutions, including universities, they have a lot of exchange programs with China and they, even they're not mentioned some sensitive issues like three T's, uh, Tibet, Taiwan, and Tiananmen Square. And several, in several cases, people avoid to touch the issue like uh, constitution democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And human rights is a very sensitive issue in China. Whenever you mention human rights, they suppose you are uh, more uh, hostile than friendly. That's very strange because it's a common, common issue to, to touch. So uh, if you say the economic cooperation and trade doesn't involve any the political issues or sensitive issues, that's not true because in many ways, uh, as people know that there's a, some products has been produced in jails in China, including uh, some uh, organs, plants, organs uh, uh, deal with Falun Gong's uh, Xue Yuan, Falun Gong's learning practitioners, right? So if you uh, face this kind of uh, issues, you must know something about the background. Know something about the real situation in China, the, of the human rights, and why they have their so competitive uh, power when they have the exports, products, because they have the low human rights status, protection, they have a low benefits, they have a low welfare in China. So some people say, no country in the world can beat China if they don't change the condition. They don't change the terms because they don't care about the human's condition. Uh, so, but nowadays, the, the situation also has been changed. Because uh, if you say the labor, uh, labor cost, Vietnam and Malaysia and other countries, they have a lower cost too. So with Vietnam became one member of their uh, TPP, while China was uh, excluded. So people can judge in the future that more uh, firms will be moved from China to uh, Vietnam and other developing countries. So my question is, like many people would raise, if China's economy about to collapse, uh, just now, I think the Dr. Wilson gave very good analysis, and he actually described many true pictures of China. I admire your uh, research. And also, uh, I would say, uh, in short term, China's economy would not collapse. Yet, there must be some crisis. The crisis actually is approaching. Uh, you could say that's a lot of like a stock crisis. You could say the real market uh, bubbles partially broken. And also you will see uh, the entrepreneurs, they don't have their uh, optimism. They don't have a confidence on China's future. Even some investors overseas, they withdraw their investment in China. They withdraw their property in China. Like uh, the famous, billionaire Li Ka Shen in Hong Kong. And he was blamed even by official media, attacked by official media as a traitor, as someone who got uh, big profits and escaped from China, and morally be, uh, you say, ruined in China with uh, official media. So that's a shame, really shame for Chinese official attitudes. Uh, some people say, oh, if you uh, look at China objectively, China still has some progress for the last three or two decades. I agree in some 
in some way. But I would say they promised too much, but while they only completed a few. Say, in 1994, they promised they have the, so many different kinds of reforms on the foreign currency system, on uh, public financial uh, system, on foreign trade system, and they promised it would be completed within five to 10 years. But now it's 20 years past already. How many has been realized? So whenever there's some, some progress achievements, they will be boasting all the time that let people know, that let people thankful, oblige to them. But actually they owe too much. They owe, just owe too much. <clears throat> so what the people, only people in China can expect more. There's no uh, political reform, no economic reform, and the revolution is impossible. Uh, and the, if you want to set, set up a new party, then definitely you'll be put into jail. And not only that, if you say something in your uh, blog, uh, criticize the party and the government, then you'll be put into jail. You will lose uh, your freedom in many ways. Like uh, after Xi Jinping got the power, more than 2,000 people has been arrested or lost their personal freedom. So in recent cases, there's a new document has been issued for CCP. It's called uh, Unproperly Talking About or Criticizing the Central Party, Central Committee's Decision or Proposals. So that's strange. It's a strange error or the title of the error. That means any party member, if you dare to challenge the proposals proposed by the Central Committee of CCP, or you, you dare to chat about the leaders in the Central Committee, then you will be considered made some mistake or serious error. And some people will be removed from their position. In recent case, uh, editor-in-chief of Xinjiang Daily, uh, he lost his uh, party membership and his uh, job as well, only because he has different opinions on the central parties, central committee's uh, policy on Xinjiang. So that's too many things to mention. <clears throat> uh, so even with those different data, you could see uh, the trade, foreign trade situation is not that good. For the past six months, the export volume has been uh, decreased and in import also has been de uh, decreased, but with the exception of the, the big purchasing contract, like uh, Chinese government purchased more than 300 uh, airplanes in US and some other plans uh, for the Airbus, and so on and so forth. So China's current economic data, you cannot really believe or depend on that, but you can compare with the previous data. It's better to compare with two decades ago and three decades ago. As I said, it's the same logic. So uh, I just make the very short uh, comment on the situation and the policy. So I'll be ready and glad to answer all the questions if you raise. Thank you. <clears throat>